Hello, everyone. Um, I am Nina Yasuda from uh, University of Miyazaki. Um, the time is now three, <laughs> one, uh, 1.30 in India. So I would like to uh, start the session. So um, let me share my screen. So, um, thank you, hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this session. Uh, I don't. So, uh, the part of session two, we have a theme that uh, science, technology, and society for SDGs. Um, so uh, in this session, we would like to discuss um, how our scientists and uh, can um, cooperate with other stakeholders and how to achieve SDGs. So um, basically I have a question about uh, what scientists and the academia can do for achieving SDGs. To achieve SDGs, uh, scientific knowledge and evidence are inevitable for effective strategies and policy making. And so we scientists have to uh, make a good advice to the local governments and uh, national governments for uh, policy make, uh, good policy making. And also to implement scientific based policies and strategies in the society, we need to build a consensus among stakeholders and we need to take action for uh, uh, achievement. So in, this pro in these processes, communication is very, very important. And also, of course, the partnership among different stakeholders and, and with different backgrounds are inevitable. So as you can see in this figure, it, all the SDGs should be achieved uh, in the on basis of partnership among governments, not only the different subject and the different field, but also among different uh, stakeholders like government, academia, and citizens and industry. Um, so let me uh, introduce a little bit about about my uh, own experience about local um, uh, partnership to achieve SDGs 14. As a marine bio uh, biologist, I have been uh, studying how to conserve coral reefs. And then um, because my university is also situated in the place where corals are propagating, I am trying to uh, conserve the, those local corals um, with local stakeholders. So we established uh, a so-called Nishinan Coral Community Conservation, um, Conservation Council that is consists of all the local stakeholders like uh, academia to coral researchers, including me and students from the university, local governments, Miyazaki Prefecture, Nishinan City, Kushima City, and also uh, fisherman union and diving sh shop and local media. So uh, gathering all the forces from the local stakeholders and communicate uh, regularly, we, we are trying to achieve conservation of coral reefs. So what we are doing uh, by, the, by this council are that uh, these are the example. Uh, for example, we, we are um, managing the coral predators, so-called 
crown of thorn starfish by scuba diving during winter time. And we also educating local kids by uh, providing the uh, opportunity for snorkel experiences on the coral sea and also teaching academic background for the uh, ecosystem. And we also organized some cor uh, coral photo exhibition in the at shopping mall to enlighten local citizens and about their own sea. So these are the uh, pictures, removal of coral predators over the last 10 years. This is a photo by uh, the local diving shop. We removed these predators from the sea. And we also are collaborating with the next generation. And as you can see in these pictures, local kids are very happy and having fun with uh, having snorkeling in the local sea. And they, are, uh, they notice that they have a very beautiful uh, sea in their own uh, home ground. So through these experiences, uh, what I have um, uh, noticed for uh, about how what scientists can do for local SDGs actions uh, that uh, it is very important that communicate well with the common goal and to find a common goal to continue conservation activities with different stakeholders and scientists uh, scientists are one of the local citizens and local stakeholders so we are also uh, in charge of taking actions and. By these taking actions uh, in the with the local people, we can gain trust and achieve scientific-based action for SDGs. So in this uh, session, we, uh, we have uh, five um, very wonderful speakers. So uh, maybe we can, uh, we can also discuss further about the partnership and the each um, subject uh, during this session. So I would like to um, uh, start the first uh, speak. I would like to invite the first speaker. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Dr. Nalesh Mulijim Vai Chauhan. Sorry, Ah, uh, sorry. The first presenter is Professor. Sang Chong Park, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this slide is wrong. I'm sorry, I'm going to back to that. The first presenter is uh, from the Republic of Korea, uh, Professor Sang Hyung Park, a member of the National Academy of Science. Please uh, take your time. Please start your presentation. Ah, really? He he didn't join yet. Okay, okay, okay. Then uh, are there Ms. E E Mong Cho from Thailand? Sorry. Mm. Sorry, uh, Hello. Hello. Can you start your presentation? Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Yasuda Meena. We also have a second chair for this uh, session today. Uh, and I would like to introduce Professor Pratik Sharma, who is the Vice Chancellor of the School of Advanced Studies. And he's also a professor in the Department of Sustainable Engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a member of the National Knowledge Network, constituted by the Central Pollution Control Board to support the activities of the National Air Clean Air Program launched by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, with this, I introduce the chair and I would request the chair to um, proceed with the further proceedings of this session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think you are muted. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Pratik, I guess your audio is not connected with the system. Maybe you have to rejoin again or you have to connect your audio. There's a mic icon at the bottom. Just click on that and there will be an option for join with computer audio. No, it's still not here. Mm -hmm. Maybe he has to rejoin again. Mm -hmm. No, sir, we still can't hear you. Hello. 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 I am Jimonju and now I am okay. Okay. Ah, ja, could you please uh, start your presentation first? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Jimonju is a yes. student uh, in English language teaching program, William uh, Lajahap. <laughs> University. Okay. In uh, could you yeah. please uh, start your presentation? Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, I, I can see you. Uh, I can see your screen. Yes, please start your presentation. Um, Hello. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Yi Mon Cho, you can go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, we can see your screen also. Yes. Should I start now? Yes, you oh. can. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, first of all, may I introduce myself? I am Yi Mon Cho. Yes, the topic I'm going to present is Global Citizenship Education, Comparative Analysis ASEAN Countries. Hello.
Hello. Hello. Hello. So I am a PhD student in English language teaching program. Education. Compare with the analysis of the country. I am a PhD student Hello. in English language teaching. Hello, Hello dear sir. Hello. I'm, I'm presenting. So I am a PhD student in English language teaching program. We are Rajabai University, okay. Thailand. Okay. Now, my okay. advisor okay. is Professor Bernardo okay. Italiano. So He's okay. okay. from Director okay. of International okay. Relations okay. Department, the College okay. of Social okay. Science. National University of East Timor. Uh, excuse me, man. Just a minute. Somebody has opened the virtual platform parallel to the Zoom link. Also, kindly close one link. Just be there. If you are on Zoom, kindly be on Zoom only. Close the other platform, please. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You can go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. You can share your screen now. Yes. So can I start? Uh, hello, everyone. The topic I'm going to present is global citizenship education, a comparative analysis of ASEAN country. Now, may I introduce myself? My name is Kim Won, and I'm a PhD student in English language teaching program, Burian Rajabai University, Thailand. My advisor is Panato Italino Lito. He is a professor and director for International Relationship Department, Faculty of Social Science, National University of East Timor. Let me begin with my introduction. Our global citizenship education has a number of important objectives. To develop student ability, to express their ideas and interpretation about global events, to think critically to apply history to modern day issues, to draw connections between local and global issues, to value social justice and equality, to evaluate global problems, to integrate knowledge and idea, to uh, collaborate in group assignments, to use electronic technologies, and to begin agents or change in their community. The United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, organized global citizenship education into three dimensions. Cognitive, socio-emotional, behavioral. What is cognitive? Cognitive is to acquire knowledge, understanding, critical thinking about global, regional, national and local issues and the interconnectedness and interdependency of different countries and population. 
to feel emotional means to have a sense of belonging to a common humanity, sharing values and responsibility, empathy, solidarity, and respect for differences and diversity. What is behavioral? It is about to have a sense of belonging to a common humanity, according to the UNESCO 2015. Now, this is about the, the, there are four covenants associated with the Asia society framework. Investigate the world, recognize perspective, communicate ideas, take action. Investigate the world means students investigate their world beyond their immediate environment. Recognize perspective means students recognize their own and other perspectives. Communicate ideas mean Students communicate their ideas effectively with diverse audiences. Take action means students translate their ideas and find it into appropriate action to improve condition, according to the Asian Society 2015. Now, let me present about the aim of the research. This paper focuses on exploring how education for global citizenship and competence is being defined and practiced uh, with a specific focus within the selected countries or ASEAN landscape on the top three level. The first one is to examine the definitions and predicts of global citizenship education, to explore the ways in which global citizenship education is developing in selected ASEAN countries, to examine how they optionalize the goal of creating globally competent citizens. Now, let me go to about methodology. In this research, I use a qualitative case study analysis using exploratory and individual case study analysis. Each of the country is explored as a distinct case, examining how the discipline optionalized the goal of creating globally competent citizens. This study is based on qualitative content analysis of publicly available documentation, including public strategy, websites, reports and mission statements by each of the selected countries in order to explore recent global citizenship education initiatives. In this study, it focuses primarily on public records associated with each country in order to provide official accounts of local level plans and politics. It starts country level background data, providing as with a profile of its country. And it is an open and exploratory approach to be selection of documents pertaining to the pristine approach to global citizenship education. This is my research area. I selected this country for my data, Cambodia University, East Timor-Leste, Malaysia University, Myanmar University, Singapore University, Thai University, and Vietnamese University. Now, this session is about the result of my research. In this table when I collect the data for the summary of background information on local assistance initiatives to promote global citizenship education, in seven countries. According to the table, East Timor Leste University has the lowest percentage of students taking part in focusing efforts on global matters while having Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand the higher percentage. English language learners mostly are able to speak in more than one language according to their data. In this table too, the terminology as key indicators of global citizenship formed in the prescribed textbook in seven countries. 
According to the finding, it was found with a positive highest result in almost all the university in forecasting efforts on global competency, global citizenship, and global ambassadorship. Empowering learners to become active global citizens is key to UNESCO overarching education. We're promoting a more just, inclusive, peaceful, and sustainable world. In the table three, it's about the approaches to global education within university as key indicator of global citizenship. From the table, it has three things that partnerships plays an important role within each other university. However, it is difficult to interpret what capacity these partnerships, including university, are related specifically to global education, study abroad programs through shorter trips, through university programs and nonprofits not directly linked to international education office. Let me discuss about my research. A number of study has gone to examine the ideas of global citizenship education uh, in the educational context for individual countries, although it is an ambiguous chance. And yet, though the results are in a satisfactory level in some university or other countries, I did not concerning with a weather and how local liberal system approach and organize the projects of global citizenship education, such as mm. whether school, uh, school system tend mm. to embrace at home, abroad, or comprehensive form of global citizenship mm. education. The finding reveals the right range of terminology used global citizenship, global mm -hmm. competency, mm -hmm. global ambassadorship, world citizenship, mm -hmm. global education, and international education. Some of the local systems draw upon language of global citizenship and competency education as rationale for strategic action. The influence of the ASEAN society work is revealing about the unique policy environment, which involves a right range of influential non-profits, for-profit advocacy organizations that may shape the definition and practice of global citizenship education. Let me conclude my research. Global citizenship education is the type of education needed to achieve this goal. It equips learners with the necessary knowledge, values, attitudes, and skills to understand, create, and sustain people's lives locally, nationally, or globally, and to address more individually and collectively current and future challenges. Today, education for global citizenship is recognized in many countries as a strategy for having children and youth prosper in their personal or professional lives and contribute to, build, uh, to building a better world. Multiple approach to global citizenship education reveals diverse practices in terms of individual education system. Moreover, partnerships plays an important role within each other countries. However, it is difficult to interpret in what capacity these partnerships are related specifically to global education. For all of the country, the extent to which where are professional development opportunities for teachers to both develop teachers' global competency and blitz skill in enhancing student global competence remains a critical area in developing comprehensive global citizenship education. Recognizing the similarity as a wall of people rather than highlighting our differences is a critical step towards achieving a more global vision of what it means to be a responsible, engaged, tolerant, and open-minded citizen. Now, let me present about the limitation of the future research. Future research is needed to explore how other ASEAN countries practice internationalization and the impact of and the impact of such initiatives, as well as 
explore larger sample or look at system, particularly as new strategy action and frameworks for cultural and global competency, or be to the lead at the international level. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Now I would like to take some questions. Um, does anyone has any question about this presentation? No one has any question. Then when I ask uh, one quest, very simple question, is it possible to, uh, I have two questions about your presentation. Is it possible to um, quantify the, the ability they gain through such um, global citizenship education? And uh, the second question is, um, uh, do you think is it enough to educate the uh, uh, to have the such uh, global citizenship education in the university, or we we need to have this kind of education in uh, no, much earlier um, uh, stage, like um, junior high school or high school? Yes, thank you for your question. I think it is not enough at the at university level. Because uh, in practicing global citizenship education, we should implement uh, for the earlier child rule stage because it will be much easier. And then if the children can practice global citizenship education in their tertiary level or secondary level or primary level, and then they are more, they will be more global citizen when they join to the university level. That's why in this level, I'm not enough to uh, implement, yes. It should be started from the earlier stage. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And, and how about the first question? Ah. Yes, uh, for me, I missed uh, your first question. So can you repeat ah, again? Uh, is it connection? possible to uh, quantify the ability they gain about global citizenship? So uh, it's a, it is also involving some emotional or somewhat an ambiguous things uh, about oh, yes. the like um, empathy or other things. So I think it's not, it's not easy to um, quantify or uh, visualize their ability. And, and, and there's no standard uh, for uh, measuring those kind of abilities. So how do you think about this kind? Yes, uh, actually uh, for me, uh, especially for Myanmar context, uh, when I, uh, practice this global citizenship education and the English language classroom. I uh, challenge uh, a lot of varieties of technology because um, most of my university students came from their multicultural background level. Mm -hmm. And then when I found that uh, when they practice about global citizenship and then they can change their emotion fast because mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for our education system, we are, uh, how can I say, we will be at the local stage. Uh, because uh, they are afraid to join international programs or international other challenge uh, cultural exchange program or partnerships because they are standing at their local state. And then this is the first step because uh, I can change or uh, find practice in global citizenship education, like especially for their emotion first. And then second step uh, will be followed by their skill because uh, when I practice in, uh, with the uh, classroom education in the classroom, but I found that when they describe each other, um, I can see they are result uh, for the good uh, or positive result. Because uh, in the earlier stage, uh, they are lack of motivation in their context. And then they focus on just passing their exam or their good grades. I mean that uh, they are not interested in the course anymore, like the exam result. They want to pass the exam and they think it is enough for them. But mm -hmm. when uh, we practice global citizenship education in the classroom, they, uh, they are aware more about uh, the importance of the course or the text rather than the exact result or 
the school. Uh, that's why uh, here for me, I'm satisfied uh, for their emotion, press, and then the way we follow for their skill, language skill, especially English language skill. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for wonderful talk. Uh, let's, uh, sorry, because the time is pressing, I would like to move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, presenter one is now here. So may I ask uh, uh, Sang Hyun Park, Dr. Sang Hyun Park to present their, uh, his uh, presentation. Uh, he is from uh, Republic of Korea and a member of the National Academy of Science. Please uh, in, uh, start your presentation. Okay, thank well, thank you very much. I, well, by some mistake, I, I went to hall, hall one and I came back to hall two again. <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to present my paper. May I share my slides? Okay, I like to share my slides. Can you see my slides? Not yet. Uh, yes, sir. We can see your slides. Just go to the presentation mode, full screen mode. Oh, well, uh, what is this? Uh, I'm 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 coming back again. Uh, uh, the system is not working well. Um, just a second. I, I'll. Just a second. One 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 second. I'm waiting. Well. <laughs> Something is wrong. Uh, do you have the backup, backup uh, my, my presentation file with you? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, let, let me try again. Uh, uh, sharing, just a second. Here, this is one. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Would you show my, my slides? Yes, yes, I can say. Yeah, please. OK. OK, thank you very much. So if I say next, please you know, uh, go to the next. OK? Well, uh, since uh, I'm a little late, I'd like to finish my talk very soon. Uh, may I spend about 10 minutes? Is okay? Okay, my topic is uh, study on the UN SDGs and the impacts of COVID-19 and activities of Korean government and people to achieve the SDGs. Next. Okay, the, the contents are as follows. Go ahead, next. Well, uh, in September uh, 19, uh, 2015, the UN Sustainable Development Summit adopted the SDGs with the 17 goals. Uh, today, the Division for Sustainable Development Goals in UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs provides substantive support and capacity building for the SDGs and their related thematic issues. Next. Well, uh, as you know, the, these are the 17 goals, 17 goals and 169 targets. Next. Well, uh, the 17 goals are classified into five P, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. Next. Well, uh, this is so-called SDG compass for companies. So the, the, this uh, SDG comp uh, compass guide presents five steps for companies to maximize their contribution to the SDGs. The five steps are, you know, step understanding the SDGs, defining priorities, setting goals, integrating and reporting and communicating. So companies are actually participating in this SDG achievement by this way. Next. 
Well, I have to talk, uh, I want to talk about the official development assistance because this is important for uh, least developed countries. Uh, there are 29 DEC development assistance committee countries under OECD and, and the DEC companies actually uh, contribute the money to help uh, a least developed countries. Actually, USA is number one uh, in donating uh, this ODA. day. Next is Germany, uh, United Kingdom, Japan, and France. And actually, Korea is number 16 uh, among 29 DEC uh, countries. Next. Well, this shows you ODA in 2020 on a grant equivalent basis. Here, Korea is actually uh, is in the middle, roughly. Next. Well, uh, COVID-19, this is very important. COVID-19 is continuing now, uh, last two years, and it is, it is still going. And the impact is a lot on the SDGs. Well, uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals Report 2021, prepared by UN Department of Economics and Social Affairs, reveals the devastating impacts of the pandemic on the SDGs. Uh, this is really terrific. Let me show you just two examples. Next. Next. Well, uh, this is, well, goal number one. COVID-19 has led to the first rise in extreme poverty in a generation. Actually, an additional 119 or 124 million people were pushed back into extreme poverty in 2020. So because of the COVID-19, many people uh, you know, pushed back into extreme poverty again. This is a terrible case. Next. Let me show you another one. And this is for uh, goal number four. COVID-19 has wiped out 20 years of education gains. Uh, it shows that an additional 101 million while nine percent of children in grades one through eight fell below minimum reading proficiency levels in 2020. So a lot of people, a lot of children, about nine percent, they pushed back to non-proficiency class, which is also terrible. Next. So, so you know, uh, all uh, goals, all 17 goals, some way were affected by COVID-19. So uh, well, these are the results, but uh, I, I, I'll just skip it. Next. Well, how about Korea? Korean SDGs and Korean activities. Well, uh, Korean people and government have actively participated in MDGs you know, um, before and SDGs now activities since the year 2000, where because the past UN Secretary General, uh, you know, Kim Eun Park, uh, he was a Korean guy, did, did an important role for the setup of SDGs, in fact. Well, uh, to, achieve, to achieve the SDG, you know, 17 SDGs, well, uh, actually many activities have been implemented in Korea. Among them, for instance, for the goal number one, no poverty, there is almost no one who lives under you know, $1.9 a day, extreme poverty in Korea. However, nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all people is not achieved yet in Korea. So we have, you know, we are trying to solve this problem now. Next. Well, this shows you the un unemployment rate. Well, uh, the un unemployment rate is a little bit, you know, uh, rising in Korea recently. And this is against actually SDG's goal, in fact. Next. Well, um, for the goal 17, partnerships for the goals, the target uh, 7.2 says that ODA providers are encouraged to consider setting a target to provide at least 0.2% of ODA divided by GNI to least developed countries. Uh, however, the, this ratio uh, of Korea is about you know 0.14% uh, as of 2020, which is below uh, 0 0.2. So uh, Korea is a little bit behind in donating money as far as ODA divided by DNI is concerned. So 
we uh, well uh, <clears throat> the ministry in charge of sdgs implementation in korea is ministry of environment uh, which operates the sustainable development committee sdc this committee established korean sdgs we call it k sdgs uh, actually four years ago uh, which modified un sdgs to k sdgs and also we established Korean major groups and other stakeholders to implement, uh, you know, UN SDGs. Next. Well, uh, for SDGs, important thing is statistics. So the Statistics Korea, uh, which is the national statistical organization, was designated as the nationally responsible organization for SDGs data, uh, which published SDGs in the Republic of Korea Progress Report 2021. So this uh, report you know, shows you how Korean people are doing uh, for, uh, you know, in order to achieve SDGs. <clears throat> well, next. Now I'd like to suggest, you know, uh, to achieve the SDGs in Korea as well as uh, all over the world. Number one is we need worldwide cooperation to cope with COVID-19. Uh, as you know well, uh, the first issue is to lessen vaccine inequality. Some, some poor countries you know, do not have enough vaccine. However, some countries have enough vaccine, vaccine. So we need vaccine inequality. We have to you know, lessen vaccine inequality. This is number one in, in to cope with COVID-19. Next. Number two is promotion of science and technology for achievement of SDGs. Well, as you know well, uh, in order to achieve SDGs, we need some support from science and technology. Uh, therefore, uh, <clears throat> promotion of ST in science and technology is necessary for every country, in particular for you know, LDCs. So DEC countries, including Korea, should help LDCs by ODA to promote science and technology so that some of SDGs can be solved by themselves. And third, human rights issue. Well, uh, in, in the 17 SDGs, uh, there's no direct goal for human rights. However, there are some close goals, such as improvement of human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, Human rights issue is also important issue for worldwide you know, consideration. Next. Active participation in ODA. Uh, this official you know, development you know, assistance is very important. And uh, so every country uh, you know, among, among that country, so other countries, we need some kind of active participation. Uh, in 2020, the total ODA was uh, 161 um, you know, billion US dollars, and the average of ODA divided by GNI percentage of 29 tech countries was 0.32%. Uh, well, this is uh, far below of the UN target of 0.7%. Korea spent $2.25 billion for ODA, which is about you know, 0.14% of ODA divided by DNI, this is below uh, than actually you know, uh, wanted. So DNA DEC countries should contribute more to ODA, including Korea. It is hoped that Korea reaches for 0.32% of ODA divided by DNA ratio in you know, 2030, hopefully. And establishment of appropriate national statistical system well, uh, this uh, sound statistical system is very important. It's a very good infra to achieve COVID-19. So to implement SDGs properly, as well as to cope with COVID-19 efficiently, an appropriate national statistical system is necessary. So every country should be you know, very much concerned with this problem. And also that countries should help uh, LDC countries to establish sound statistical system by themselves. Next. Now, uh, finally, uh, I'd like to mention about the designation of proper SDGs administration body. 
this is also important. Each country has its own administration body for SDGs, whose position in each government should, could be different from country to country. In Korea, the body is the Ministry of Environment and the nationally responsible organization for SDGs data is the Statistics Korea. However, for the 17 SDGs, five goals are related to the environment, four goals to the economy, and six goals to the society, and two goals to the general. So it seems that the Ministry of Education has some difficulty to control other ministries for SDGs management in Korea, in my opinion. Hence, in Korea, the Prime Minister's office is the better place for the SDGs administration body. Other countries may have the similar problems. So this is my suggestion you know, uh, for the problem. Well, uh, next. So uh, I'd like to <laughs> you know, uh, you know, talk very fast in order to finish you know, early. Thank you very much. And I'm, you know, I welcome for you any question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for a very wonderful talk about uh, giving a, pr providing a, of our picture of the SDGs and and introducing some subject about um, uh, statistics. So I would like to take a very one short question. Yeah. Uh, are there any question about this? Mm. Uh, sorry, yeah, may I ask a very short okay. question? I, I, yes, I, 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 I deeply agree that the that, uh, Ministry of Environment is associated with six goals, and but it, very, it has very hard time controlling other ministries. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, because uh, environment is uh, one of the basis of the achieving SDGs. Um, yeah. So do you have any... Uh, uh, um, in Japan, I think the uh, Ministry of Environment does not have uh, much money, so they have a relatively weak uh, power among the ministries. Uh, how about in Korea? And how can how do you think what's the, the um, best way to uh, change this <laughs> situation? Um, well, uh, at the beginning, you know, uh, they they thought that the SDGs are pretty much related to environment environment problems, so they, they assigned the job to the Ministry of Environment. However, later on, we, 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 we have found that economic problems, social problems, you know, other many technical problems are related to, you know, SDGs. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, Korean government is also thinking about this problem, and perhaps uh, the new government very soon they they may may move, you know, <laughs> the administration body from the Ministry of Ed you know Environment to the Prime Minister's office. That's my personal opinion, and that's the correct way to do so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The situation will be changing in the next um, yeah. uh, few years. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank the, you. The next uh, speaker will be uh, um, Professor Simon Wong Park from uh, uh, Republic of Korea, uh, um, who is a member of National Academy of Science. So uh, please start your talk. Thank you very much. Professor Paul, you are muted.
This is going. Wow. Okay, can you see my slide? No? Oh my god. Yes, yes sir, we can see your slide. I mean I my slide. I am okay, I'm I'm gonna try one more time. And uh, I'm gonna select this one. And can you see my slide? How, how come it's not Yes, yes, we can. Okay, here we are. Uh, the, the, I also had uh, some problem with the, to communicate uh, and then uh, to find this room. The title of my presentation is Monitoring and Modeling of Hydrology and Water Quality for Sustainable Petty Irrigation. Contents are the monitoring the watershed hydrology and the modeling, the field of field and watershed hydrology water quality, uh, modeling the irrigation systems and the concreting remarks. Uh, we have, uh, the, I have to uh, skip the sum uh, in, in my presentation because of time. Uh, this slide shows, uh, okay, let me, uh, we had uh, implemented the three uh, watershed monitoring project since uh, from 1985 to 2014. The, they were the, the Banur watershed and Baran watershed and uh, the wastewater reuse project. Uh, we started at the Banur watershed in 1985. But highway construction was on the way, so we had to move to the, the monitoring programs to the Baran watershed in 1996. And the wastewater reuse programs was implemented from 2000 to 2009. The locations are shown in the Google map. Uh, this picture shows that uh, the monitoring uh, activities. Uh, the, the surface floor was measured using uh, plumes at the ditches. To major the stream pro, we installed the water level gauges and uh, major the flow velocity to develop the rating curve. And for irrigate, irrigation water flows, the canal was measured also uh, using the water level gauges and daily water water depths at the paddy fields were surveyed manually. And we check the on-site water quality and the sample the water for laboratory analysis, like the picture. Uh, the picture shows the rice farming scenes from the transplanting to harvesting at the wastewater reuse experimental field. Uh, three irrigation water was used. They were the groundwater effluent from the swan sewage treatment plant and reclaimed the effluent from the plant using the sand filtration and UV light uh, disinfection. The object of the, the tiny experiment was to find out the effects of reclaimed wastewater uh, on the rice growth and the yield and water quality. Health issue was also uh, investigate, investigated the poor the farmers uh, who worked uh, on the field. Now the run of curve number. Run of curve number is important to product estimation. However, the curve number had not been defined for irrigated paddy field. So we carried out the monitoring programs to determine the run of curve numbers as shown in the left side figure. Uh, we define the rainfall runoff relationship from the from the observed data, and the results were plotted in the in the graph. Uh, the from the rainfall runoff relationships, 
uh, we define the US NRCS run of curve number or CN. Uh, the CNs for 3 AMC uh, antecedent moisture contents AMC 1 to 3 were 70, 79, and 89. Uh, most of the paddy field in Pratt area had been consolidated. However, the paddy field has been under implemented the land consolidation projects in 60s and 70s are so no longer good for modern mechanized farming. Uh, the size of paddy fields are small and uh, palm loads are not good for the driving vehicles and uh, old irrigation uh, and drainage ditches did not function properly. So the large, large side uh, land consolidation project has been uh, implemented to, for the rehabilitating those old project sites in South Korea. And uh, the large paddy fields had a new issue. That is, it took too much time for the water to drain from the paddy field. Uh, so the, to find out why and to resolve the how, we set up the field monitoring program. There are two paddy fields. One was the recently consolidated large paddy field, and the other was a typical paddy field. And the water levels during the irrigation and drainage operations were measured and compared. Some results are shown here. And the 2D hydrodynamic model was applied to simulate that water levels at different points at the large field during the irrigation and drainage. The results was very good. And uh, so we applied the models to simulate uh, uh, drainage characteristics. So the we come up with that the uh, receding water levels at the large large field, and it took uh, sorry six hours to drain out the uh, drain out the water as shown in the figure. The other two curves were simulation result from the modification to drainage systems. And then the case one was to modify the drainage outlet by cutting the elevation by 0.1 meter. The resulting drainage time was less than 20 hours. Case two was to lay out that uh, small shallow ditches at pit paddy field to case one. The result showed that uh, the time to drain was uh, for drainage reduced to less than 10 hours. We thought the 24 hours was about the reasonable time for the drainage, so we suggested the outlet modification like case one would help solve the problem. Uh, I am introducing a, a water quality model for irrigated the paddy field. It, this one is very uh, popular in many countries. Uh, we have a proposed the Queen's paddy model. The input data include the weather data, the irrigation and fertilization, and the total coliform data. And the model simulate daily water depths and drainage, and uh, total nitrogen, phosphorus, total coliform concentration at the paddy field. Simulation results were compared reasonably well with the observed total nitrogen concentration. Uh, which is shown in the upper curve. The comparison between the simulated total coliform and the observed data were also presented. Actually, not enough coliform data were available for model validation. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we needed to improve the sub models to simulate uh, better total coliform pits in natural environment. Okay, I am going to talk about the irrigation system modeling. Uh, an irrigation system of the paddy field like this uh, aerial picture consists of many components such as reservoir, weir, streams, irrigation canals, ditches, paddy field, and drainage ditches, and so on and so on. The, if we are going to have a, a schematic diagram so to simplify the irrigation system, it's uh, in the next page. 
So we assume that an irrigation block, uh, which is an operational unit, that consists of uh, more than one irrigation unit. The block was to link to the irrigation canal and drain a ditch, and the irrigation water to a block was to be controlled by Canal Pro and in that geometry. And the drainage rates are defined from the water depths and the outlet dimensions at the block. The figure shows the hydrology and irrigation and drainage management at an irrigation block of the paddy field. The figure also depicts the pathway of water. The water passes may be changed or modified by operation and management. So we all put those, those uh, information together. Uh, we, we run that, the model and uh, simulate the, uh, all the result. So it's a field application result. So block diagram shows on a schematic for the panel paddy fields about about 409, 409 hectare. The field was divided into 13 blocks. Hydrological variables are simulated from block 1 to block 13, and the water depths at blocks are also defined. Around now, let's check the, the results, but how, how the model did the job. The simulated daily discharge at the region number 3 was compared to the observed data, observed data, the results were okay. Uh, simulated data, uh, simulated water depths for the for block number three was compared to the observed data. Uh, result varied all right to, from uh, all right to not so good. The red arrow indicates a significant difference of the uh, different observed and simulated water depths. We thought that such differences were possible only when the irrigation water did not flow into the paddy, paddy field, but directly drained to the system. Uh, nevertheless, we thought that the irrigation system modeling is important to efficient operation and management of the system. Why? We could have a distribution of irrigation water within the irrigation system. We could simulate the response of the uh, system to different water supply method. Therefore, we, we could improve the irrigation efficiency. Uh, now, why paddy field irrigation is important to the sustainable development? Rice is a stable crop in Korea and in many SHA uh, countries, uh, members' countries as well. High production of the rice with efficient paddy pad irrigation is important to SDGs number two. Efficient paddy fields irrigation helps the bridge of the water quality of the streams, rivers, and lakes. It is important to SDGs six. Ecological system of paddy fields has been well documented. The vital ecosystems should be conserved through the efficient paddy irrigation, which leads to SDG 15. So I think we need to put on a high priority to efficient paddy field irrigation to achieve the sustainable development goal. And that was my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for the nice talk. Uh, I'm sorry, the time is too pressing. So uh, I will take question if I uh, it, we have a time after all the presentation is finished. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. So let's move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Ms. Uh, Shambhagi Jain uh, from India, University of De uh, Delhi. Um, Community-based adaptation as an alternative to dominant development paradigms. Uh, please uh, start your talk. You are muted, I think. Uh, good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. I am Shubhangi Jain and uh, Shruti Sinha with me. We are students of Masters in Critical Science from University of Delhi, and we'll be presenting on community-based adaptations as an alternative to dominant development paradigms, a case of Mekong River Basin. To begin with, uh, to set the context, I would like to talk about the uh, changing definitions and urgency of sustainability from 1987 to 2015 when the concept of SDGs came in. In 1987, sustainability by Brundtland Commission was defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And uh, when we come forward to 2015, it actually shows us how over the last three decades, the pace of climate change and its devastating impacts have acutely affected the discourse of sustainability. And now there's a sense of urgency and a quick effective response strategy that is needed. That is why it is essential to bring science, society, technology and SDGs together in order to ensure a future which is uh, which meets the need of our future generations and for the present generations as well. The sustainability challenge is largely about how human societies in the 21st century choose to build, maintain and reform the social technological systems of the future. Hence, STS as an approach is multidisciplinary and holistic in itself. The literature on sustainability to examine alternative models on a disciplinary basis has been limited before the introduction of STS, hence emphasizing uh, the importance of bringing in STS with SDGs. Now, why we are talking about the Mekong River Basin, there are some factors that I would like to outline. Firstly, uh, geographical, that it supports the livelihood of more than 70 million people. Moreover, climate change accelerated by hydropower dams has further increased competition for water resources and climate induced salt water intrusion into agriculture areas has hampered rice production in the Delta. And also the flooding has led to threatening of local livelihoods. More than that, there's also a cultural significance. Uh, Mekong River Basin is all, Mekong River is also called as the mother of all rivers. Uh, primarily because as you can see in this map, how Mekong River flows through the Southeast Asia, uh, from, from China to Southeast Asia. And now uh, which part of the river, for, which, what percentage of the river falls in which country is shown in this particular map. 16% in China, 2% in Myanmar and so on. So as it comes downwards, the intensity and the width also increases. Political reasons are ASEAN, uh, which is a political organization of Southeast Asian countries, uh, even though uh, how uh, the issue of Mekong River Basin uh, needs uh, urgent uh, pressing, it has compartmentalized characterization and has shown indifference to Mekong environmental goals despite the impact of the region's food security and climate change action. And the Mekong River Commission does not involve the upstream country, which is China. Hence, finance and politics in, uh, play a major role more than the knowledge systems and finally the economic factor which is the dominant development paradigm which i will unfold in the next slide so the dominant development paradigm is basically talking about the capitalist mindset and the modernization perspective that uh, countries all across the world are adapting uh, developing countries uh, are adapting and developed countries have already adapted so capitalism is reliant on the use of energy contained in coal in uh, carbon forest rock steam, uh, rock scene. Uh, excuse me, Shivanji. Just, just a minute. Your screen is not moving. Put oh. on the slideshow, please. The slideshow is on. Uh, can you see my screen? We can only see your first screen, that first slide, and that is too frozen. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you tell me which slide can you see? The dominant development. The paradigm? first one. We can just only see the community-based adaptation. Your okay. topic slide only. Okay, okay. I don't know. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Now it is. Can you put on the slideshow? There's a button on the right. Yeah, just press that. Is it better? Can you see it now? Uh, no, it is not. But still, I guess maybe you can change slide from here only. Uh, I think this is this form is better than to have an access. Right? Are you using uh, 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 Apple Macintosh or Windows? Windows only. Is my screen visible now? Yes, can you it see? Is, it is visible. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. I Okay, okay. So uh, the further principle that capitalism follows is that every product is having a byproduct, which basically means our ability to extract natural resources has generated a monstrous amount of waste and other forms of environmental degradation. As James Scott uh, writes in his book, uh, Seeing Like a State, he argues that the capitalist paradigm follows the careers of high modernism, which tend to see rational order in visual aesthetic terms. And also as Jonathan Park argues in his article in 2015, the promise of an inexhaustible well of human ingenuity capable of overcoming any conceivable scarcity of socially desirable resources ensures that capitalist economies will theoretically never 
need to shrink or slow down. Uh, so this map basically shows how mainstream Mekong dams are located in the entire region. And as you can see, the upstream river, river has more dams, both planned, operational, and under construction as compared to the lower, uh, main, uh, lower stream uh, river. So dams block more than 50% of the Mekong sediment load, which is necessary for fishery and agriculture, especially in Cambodia and Vietnam. And natural floods, which used to send sediments across the Mekong Delta, but the upstream dams are now reducing that ability to provide fresh water to the Mekong Delta. Now to give an insight and some quantifiable data, we have some uh, data taken from Stimson Mekong Infrastructure Tracker. It actually shows the data overview of raid ro uh, raid road, uh, rail and waterways So uh, across countries. So this shows by length and uh, projection type. Then uh, this uh, actually shows the industrial spaces across countries. Uh, followed by uh, the industrial spaces in Mekong by area. This is followed by the power generation. As you can see, both operational under construction and planned have the maximum share uh, given to hydropower, which uh, brings us back to a point why we need to problematize Mekong River Basin to understand STS as an approach and uh, Mekong uh, community-based adaptations. And furthermore, this is uh, the power generation. Uh, across countries in the Mekong power sector. Uh, I would like Shruti to take over from now. So from the discussion so far, we can understand that how the dominant development paradigm has been operationalized through institutions in the Mekong region. Uh, we actually have a video here to show, which actually shows how STS works as an ideal approach in Mekong, in the context of Mekong. So I'll just play the video. Uh, I sorry to interrupt you. Audio is not coming. Audio isn't coming. No, we can't hear. Okay, just... You have to share audio also. Just okay. unshare your screen once. Okay. I'll guide you. Kindly stop sharing the screen. Again, when you share the screen, there's a there's a there's a uh, checkbox that you have to put share audio. Uh, can you uh, hear it now? with the climate impacts that they were experiencing? Yes, it is now. And local knowledge in order to help the poorest people in the region to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Starting from the vulnerability assessment as a basis, we went into the communities and we talked to them and got inputs from them using a series of participatory tools. We used community mapping and overlaid that with the climate impacts that they were experiencing. โลกฮอนหรือว่าการเปลี่ยนแปลงของสภาพว่าอากาศนี้In some cases, the scientific view and the community view were a little bit different. For the communities, it was really key that they bought into the science. In other cases, the science really did validate what the communities are seeing on the ground. And this merging of understanding took place between science and local knowledge. หลังจากที่มีโครงการเข้ามาหลายๆโครงการบอกว่าจะเริ่มเป็นเรื่องน้ําเรื่องพันธุ์เข่าหรือว่าเรื่องสัตว์เลี้ยงและก็เรื่อง
United States Agency for International Development uh, to bridge the gap between the science and the local knowledge, which is very essential from what we have come so far and in understanding STS sustainability at large and in the context of Mekong. Now, how do we situate STS in Mekong? Is through the indigenous knowledge system and bringing of science together with legitimacy being given to both and, and in an inclusive manner with participatory grassroots initiatives. And here the technology serves as an interface and community-based adaptation can be situated at the crux of this whole approach, which can make this process attainable through which we can attain the uh, sustainable uh, livelihood or patterns of adaptation in Mekong region and elsewhere is what uh, at large elsewhere. So for a successful knowledge uh, co-production process should be encouraged, openly shared knowledge, inclusiveness to multiple types of knowledge is essential. Instead of operating in binary terminologies and the knowledge should be produced ultimately through the process of uh, communication and interaction between all the state among all this between and among all the stakeholders taiwan paper is one such one such is a product of one such process uh, so this chart here situates cba that is community based adaptation at the interface of the sts model here in how it shows how indigenous model systems are capable of being uh, integrated into the uh, knowledge systems and policy orientations, which would ensure shared learning processes and implementation, which will uh, procure results at the level, grassroots level as the process itself involves not only indigenous knowledge systems, but as well as stakeholders, which are directly being impacted and experiencing the casualties caused by the uh, absolute uh, de development paradigm that has been uh, taking place in the Mekong region. Uh, so to make my case uh, further uh, for community-based adaptation in the Mekong region, one such uh, concept is that of ethnohydrology. So ethnohydrology is proposed. Uh, this concept uh, basically means is an alternative approach to reflect bodies of water-related knowledge beyond the polarization of science versus local knowledge. So this is very important to be addressed here. And we see that this is happening in the northern eastern part of Thailand, where an, uh, an ethnohydrological approach has been adapted to deal with water-related issues instead of operating in the conventional paradigm between or framing in binaries. So such an approach can help uh, blur the divide between the science and the local knowledge and unfold a project uh, a productive trajectory which can be implemented uh, so that can be that is one of the approaches and uh, potentially used in some of the regions of thailand and has been um, suggested that other regions can also adapt because water related issues especially pertaining to fisheries and flooding and livelihood challenges have been at the core in the lower uh, mekong basin region Another uh, inst another thing that uh, the STS model and CBA, when brought together, insists on is co-production of knowledge, for which the case of uh, uh, wetlands and incorporating good agricultural practices uh, is uh, a relevant intervention here. As in Laos, organic rice was uh, organic rice growing practices were uh, formulated and practiced in order to not only meet the export goals that were set by the uh, in the region but also it led to improvement in the degrading soil quality so basically this whole process in laos uh, savanket district province took place in a manner that all the stakeholders came together there was a lot of worry pertaining to the quality of soil already and there were apprehensions if they would be able to meet the export needs so indigenous practices of uh, growing uh, rice in these paddy regions were adopted and together amalgamated with the advancements that science and technology has made. And they were able to produce not only the export, the needs, export needs that is serving their financial need, but at the same time, they were able to cater to the quality of soil, which is going to sustain for the long, the future generations. Likewise, cultivation, cultivation practices have been uh, taken up in the 
Tara Hat Hamlet in the Vietnam region, wherein there was a lot of landslide, landslide cases and it was causing loss to livelihood and affecting the agricultural patterns. So particularly here, an adopt, uh, an, a method was adopted, which is called as the participatory land use planning, so that the landslides and other da damage due to the flooding and the soil erosion could, put, could be put in check. So they came together with the regional stakeholders and they decided to test the model of climate smart agricultural interventions. Again, these interventions are based on the uh, local knowledges and uh, farming cultivation practices and mapping, not just only through the scientific uh, a mapping, not a mapping process, not devoid of local knowledge, primarily based on scientific understanding only, but rather incorporation of the local knowledge systems in the whole process of uh, mapping the region and further cultivating and so on and so forth. Here, one more thing when we talk about local knowledge, something that I would like to mention is the role of folklore and mystic stories and myths that are present in the Southeast Asian region. There's a, there are like a plethora and a treasures of stories and often looked down upon and no, seen as something that doesn't have whole relevance. However, these stories, a lot of our researchers who have worked there at ground level from have shown that how these stories and these uh, folklores have a message deep down about how the man and nature can sustain together, live together, and it goes beyond the anthropocentric paradigm that we are so fixated with. So I think local knowledge system in forms of cultural forms, uh, which may not be directly seen as a knowledge system also needs to be explored and has been explored in these parts at a uh, certain small scale interventions. However, we think that such an intervention needs to be enlarged and expanded and those knowledge systems also needs to be incorporated while we are uh, going ahead with the uh, CBA models of sustainable uh, livelihood and you know, practices in the Mekong region and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So now here, this is the map of the Mekong region. And what, what this map highlights is the forest, uh, the green, green cover in the region, the paddy. Basically, it is uh, through this slide, what we're trying to show you is that how productive and how, uh, how, how diverse the ecosystem of this area is and gets back to the point that why we are problematizing the Mekong region as such against the developmental paradigm and proposing for a paradigm which balances both in a equitable and uh, legitimate manner and all stakeholders are involved. Well, as far as the way forward is concerned, we have seen a lot of discussions in the international forums and even in uh, state policies around circular terminal, circular economy, green, cleaner technology and climate justice. We see these things happening uh, in the discourses. However, we firmly believe that these things can be brought into practice through community-based adaptations as we need to acknowledge and work towards the understanding that the most vulnerable communities have not been uh, heard of and in the discourse for the long and it is important to combat the issue that we take their uh, knowledge systems, their knowledge processes, their mitigation abilities into consideration while we deal with the issue. So at hand, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation. Um, because time is pressing, uh, the next present, uh, every, we move, move on to the next presenter. Uh, Dr. Nalesh Maru, uh, Muli, Muli, sorry, sorry, I could not pronounce properly. So from India, uh, he represents digital technology for tribal uh, producers. And please go ahead. Thank you, madam. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are. Uh, the uh, title of the presentation is Digital Technology for Tribal Products Scope for Inclusive Development in Gujarat. Uh, this paper deals with the ways in which we can build the online platform of marketing for tribal communities in Eastern tribal belts of Gujarat. Gujarat is one of the states of Indian uh, Union. Uh, this paper is based on the 
recommendation which we submitted to government of Gujarat, uh, Ministry of Tribal Development, uh, as a form of project report uh, titled Economic Development Vision for Tribals in Gujarat. Uh, in Gujarat, uh, the tribals are facing social and economic exclusions uh, till the date. Uh, and the main reason is that they are living in segregated Eastern tribal belts where the infrastructure of almost all kind, and they are very poor. Uh, they are, there are no roads, infrastructures, uh, no educational health infrastructures, and uh, the communication infrastructure is uh, very poor. Uh, in state of Gujarat, uh, basically, uh, the tribals are uh, uh, face uh, the problems of uh, marketing, uh, and there is a huge uh, gap uh, for uh, tribals uh, to market their uh, product. Uh, hence, uh, the in recent decade. Uh, the popularity and adaptability of digital technology among the tribal's community uh, create the new scope for inclusive development in this Gujarat state. Digital technology in form of uh, internet services uh, became very popular in these uh, reasons. Uh, after uh, in a second decade of uh, 21st century, uh, century uh, the tribals uh, are uh, very familiar with this uh, digital technology via smartphone uh, and uh, uh, the government also promote uh, the uh, digital India uh, mission so that uh, tribals uh, are uh, very much familiar as well as they are using this digital technology. Uh, now the reality is that uh, they can connect entire world uh, on internet, um, but uh, uh, they, they are facing so many difficulties for their uh, neighboring marketing places as they are living in a, a segregated and uh, scattered uh, uh, colonies uh, and they are remote areas. Uh, so there is tremendous scope for digital technology to create online marketing platform for their uh, products. And these are the problem, uh, problems they are facing. Uh, they are facing uh, transport uh, wastages, uh, mediators uh, also prevailing when they are rich uh, at the market. Uh, low, uh, uh, after all, all these uh, limitations, the low productions and uh, poverty still exist in these tribal belts. Uh, tradition, they are using traditional transportation, uh, which we can see in these uh, pictures. Uh, they all they together go to the marketplaces uh, with their uh, little bit uh, production uh, uh, bag. Uh, as they are living in a remote areas, uh, entire day uh, they spent in this marketing process uh, by the help of digital technology or modern technology uh, we can provide them the modern transportation facilities uh, and uh, we recommended uh, remote uh, the name of this uh, digital platform the full form is uh, uh, remote area enhancement by providing marketing online platform transport and ease of doing business uh, to uh, uh, ap apply all these uh, marketing platform uh, not only the digital marketing platform uh, but state also uh, would provide uh, transportation facilities as uh, the state also running the uh, local uh, state transport buses and some others uh, uh, transportation facilities there. Uh, the available, uh, the requirement of providing such uh, uh, 
transportation as well as uh, online platform uh, so they specially use uh, crates uh, specially designed use crates uh, would be there in this uh, remote uh, project uh, and this crates uh, uh, has its uh, unique uh, identity with uh, barcode uh, how the entire project uh, uh, will implemented the requirement of software are uh, the mandi the meaning of mandi is market in local language uh, the full form is smartphone application uh, uh, that mandi is just a smart uh, smartphone application the full form is marketing assistance by networking of distance uh, and then after uh, uh, the sathi one and sathi two uh, that is also the smartphone application uh, that uh, would be a uh, used by the uh, transport operator and the uh, storage uh, storekeepers uh, and uh, uh, finally the third uh, uh, program uh, for uh, in form of sm uh, smartphone application that is remote uh, that would be a uh, uh, used by the buyer or consumer a buyer uh, uh, means uh, in uh, urban areas uh, there are retailer can also apply this uh, remote uh, pl platform uh, how uh, the entire project uh, is uh, will work uh, once the producer offer to sell his production price quality ads uh, buyer can contact direct with the produce uh, producer as they took interest in offer uh, with uh, uh, personal uh, contact uh, with the help of uh, personal contact buyer and seller mutually decide uh, the price of the production the quality time and destination of delivery uh, by the uh, help of this uh, mandi uh, program as per the uh, deal, buyer pack the crates. Uh, once the buyer get the order from the, uh, once the uh, producer get the order with this uh, platform, uh, 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 as uh, the dealer buyer uh, pack the crates, lock it and scan the barcode of crates. Uh, buyer uh, buyer uh, fill all the requirement information in this program and uh, after uh, he deliver it to the transport operator uh, here it is uh, here the bus conductor will get it uh, just to scan the barcode of crates hence the bus conductor scan barcode all the details registered with uh, mandi are copied to uh, sathi one uh, that is the software of uh, transport operator uh, uh, it is here bus conductor uh, and then the bus will go uh, the go to the uh, go it destination and deliver it to the uh, storage uh, storekeeper. Uh, the st storage of this all this crate uh, will be located in the urban areas. Uh, here uh, we for Gujarat we can say the near cities. All the cities will have uh, such a storage capacity for uh, this crates uh, uh, in addition uh, in present the entire uh, transportation facilities have uh, parcel services and they have already such a uh, sto storage but the volume by this uh, remote project will increase and the needs of the storage would be some cooling places or refrigerating places because most of the tribals will use uh, for their uh, perishable commodities as uh, fruits, vegetables, and flowers uh, that is expected. Uh, so that storage capacity will be enhancing. Uh, finally, the buyer or the consumer will uh, get uh, delivery from the nearby uh, urban areas uh, store. Uh, after all, uh, the uh, entire this uh, functioning, uh, 
there are some provision of uh, feedback or reviews by both the side producer as well as uh, the consumer and they review their uh, client and uh, the next order will be considered accordingly uh, <clears throat> Uh, as far as uh, dealing some cases of uh, disputes, uh, there would be a, some uh, special settlement system uh, and it is also recommended uh, in this entire project. Uh, that is, uh, we have already recommended to the government of uh, Gujarat. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we have a, a, a question from the audience. Uh, what is the status of the preservation of this uh, in indigenous knowledge as with advancing globalization, indigenous practices are endangered? Uh, can you answer this question? I yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. In indig indigenous knowledge, uh, there are uh, some grain preservation is uh, prevailing there, but in case of uh, fruits and vegetables, there is very limited indigenous knowledge to preserve that. They are just uh, weight uh, uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, but it is very limited and it can uh, preserve just uh, two, uh, two, two weeks. Mm -hmm. But in case of grains, they can preserve for uh, two to three more years. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Is it, uh, are there any other question about the previous, including for the previous presentation from the audience? No, then uh, because the time is, um, we are <laughs> over the time. Uh, could the uh... Dr. Meena, uh, can we also okay. take this opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Pratik Sharma, who might like yes. to say a few words yeah. because you missed him in the beginning? Yes, 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 of course. And yeah. please wrap up this session, please. Uh, yeah, so please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Joyshree. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, please. Okay, okay. thank you so much. And uh, so we had a, a wonderful session here, uh, which primarily focused on you know, science and technology and uh, society for achieving the SDGs, under which we had five presentations uh, covering, uh, you know, different aspects. Uh, the first one was presented by uh, Dr. Yi Bun Shu in which uh, she highlighted uh, global citizenship education and in which she carried out a, a, a comprehensive analysis uh, using case study of, uh, you know, how uh, the global citizenship education program is, uh, you know, uh, uh, can be implemented. And she took a case study of seven countries. Uh, uh, what she emphasized was to the main objective of such a, uh, 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 program, especially the GCE, was to draw connections between the local and global issues, which uh, was is the primary objective, and to basically integrate uh, the knowledge and ideas, and in which she also examined various definitions and practices of global uh, citizenship education. Uh, what uh, was emphasized was basically, you know, and she basically uh, identified uh, as one of the key challenge areas uh, area as uh, uh, professional uh, development uh, opportunities for teachers. Uh, this uh, still remains an area that needs to be addressed in order to uh, develop comprehensive uh, 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 GCE. And these are to develop teachers uh, for global competency and to build skills in enhancing student uh, global uh, competence. Uh, so this was the base uh, highlight of the first presentation. And the second presentation was given by Professor Sung Yoon Park, uh, which was a study on UN SDGs and uh, the impact of COVID-19 
and activities of Korean government and people to achieve the SDGs. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the presentation uh, highlighted that uh, COVID-19 has impacted almost all the uh, 19 uh, SDGs, but the major impact of uh, especially the uh, COVID-19 has been observed uh, in the first SDG goal, which is on poverty, and on the fourth, uh, uh, which in fact uh, is on the quality of education. Uh, the highlight, uh, he highlighted uh, about uh, the, the Korean SDGs and uh, the importance that the Ministry of Education in Korea uh, 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 has basically established a Korean SDG uh, committee. And the most important, the highlight of his presentation, which I uh, considered to be the most important was to lay emphasis on uh, statistical evidence-based implementation of SDGs. And uh, there are there were certain recommendations, uh, the important uh, one being, and uh, in the context of COVID, COVID uh, uh, global cooperation basically to uh, reduce the vaccine inequality. This is something the phrase was quite, you know, uh, was the highlight of his uh, these things one of the recommendations and promotion of science and technology uh, for SDGs again in which uh, 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 yeah and then you know he mentioned about est uh, establishment of appropriate national statistical system which in my view is uh, 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 something very important because through that only we can actually see how and how uh, you know how far we are achieving the SDGs in a quantitative terms, and uh, uh, then we uh, uh, the the achievement basically when we quantify these things, we are able to really find out uh, what more needs to be done. And in case we are doing it properly, we do get good evidences uh, supported by data uh, to continue the the correct path that is, that has been adopted. Uh, he also advocated uh, that the SDGs, SDGs should have uh, the human rights as the basis uh, for form, forming, the, forming the SDGs and, uh, and also emphasized on the uh, designation of proper uh, SDGs administrative administration body. Then we had uh, uh, a very interesting presentation by Dr. Sung Wu Park, uh, which uh, incidentally uh, uh, is also my area of interest, which is on related uh, to monitoring and modeling of hydrology and water quality for sustainable paddy irrigation, in which uh, uh, the study basically emphasized on efficient irrigation practices to increase the paddy production. And this is something very important that we, you know, uh, we talk about food, energy, water nexus, and uh, in that regard, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the study uh, was, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, timely and useful because uh, paddy is one crop which requires uh, a lot of water. And uh, if you actually, if we are able to develop some efficient, uh, you know, irrigation practices, uh, especially, you know, in the context of uh, 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 the countries where uh, 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 rice happens to be the staple diet, uh, you know, uh, we can actually not even uh, uh, increase the productivity uh, at lower water demand. And in that context, uh, Dr. Park emphasized that if we do that, we would be able to achieve the second uh, SDG goal, which is really, which is a zero hunger. And in fact, uh, 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 as a as a as an outcome of this, he also emphasized uh, that uh, efficient uh, uh, irrigation practices can also result in improving the water quality of, water quality of uh, surface water bodies such as lakes, streams, estuaries, and which uh, in turn will also uh, 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 help in meeting the sixth SDG, which is uh, the clean water and sanitation. Uh, uh, then there was a very interesting uh, presentation given by Shubhangi and Shruti on uh, community-based adaptation uh, 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 as an alternative to dominant uh, 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 development paradigms in which uh, a very interesting case study of Mekong River was uh, uh, given. 
uh, which in fact, uh, if you see, you know, when you see water, usually what happens is, and this is something I, I, as an engineer, I would, you know, I found that to be very interesting in the sense that, you know, when we uh, speak about water, we usually think uh, uh, from the engineering and technology point of, point of view or science, science point of view, but actually water has multiple dimensions, the social aspects, the legal aspects, the financial aspects, along with, you know, the associated science and technology issues related uh, with, uh, you know, any river and especially the, the context of, you know, choosing a Mekong River as a case study, uh, Mekong River, uh, river Basin, Basin, Basin was uh, quite elaborately highlighted. And uh, mm, uh, the STC, STS based approach was emphasized, which uh, in fact is uh, uh, what is needed actually, because uh, unless and until we, uh, uh, you know, uh, address the issue of water uh, in a holistic manner, we won't be able to solve uh, the problems associated with water. So in that context, what was advocated was to blend science with the indigenous knowledge system and to make society for inclusive participation. And what was recommended was to have community-based adaptation. And a few uh, uh, relevant uh, studies were also uh, cited by the, by the presenters. And uh, three key words basically emerged what, uh, uh, in fact, which are being you know, quoted quite uh, prominently these days, uh, which is basically circular, circular economy, clean, cleaner technology, and climate justice. And finally, we had uh, a presentation by uh, 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 Mr. Naresh Chauhan, in which uh, he presented on the digital technology for uh, tribal producers. And in fact, which is very timely, especially in the COVID times. And, and I feel that uh, COVID-19 has catalyzed several uh, you know, uh, such technologies which otherwise would have uh, taken, uh, say, years to be implemented. Now people are thinking in terms of such uh, options and technologies which, uh, 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 which uh, uh, the world is seeing, you know, getting implemented at a, at a very fast pace. And uh, uh, so in which in this presentation, he highlighted, you know, uh, 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 the details of building online platform for of marketing for tribal community uh, in Eastern tribal belts of Gujarat. And uh, uh, the, the platforms that uh, has, have been developed and have been found to be quite useful. And uh, if these are implemented and these are scaled up, uh, can, uh, 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 can become very revolutionary, uh, you know, the kind of uh, the platforms which have been suggested, uh, such as Sathi 1 and 2, Mandi for marketing and remote, a uh, very interesting study. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, 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 the interesting part was this, that uh, the session had wide ranging topic, topics, all basically, you know, uh, covering different aspects uh, related to, uh, you know, uh, science, technology and society for SDGs. And uh, it was a wonderful session. And uh, I hope I have been able to summarize uh, all the major highlights of the of the of the the, the presentations which were made, and uh, it was a it was a real learning experience to be you know part of uh, uh, this session. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to you know be part of uh, 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 this session, and uh, thank you so much. On behalf of ICSSR New Delhi, I would like to thank Dr. Yasuda Nina and uh, Professor Pratik Sharma for joining this session and sharing the session. Uh, we look forward to more such sessions in the future. Uh, at the moment, we are breaking for lunch, but uh, please join us uh, for the poster presentations in the ho ho hall, and we hope to be back soon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you on behalf of ICSSR. Mm -hmm.